There's a gentleman in his late 70s who is slowly and yet intently walking along a path that's beside of a beach. It's along this bluff overlooking a beach and his wife and his children, his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren follow about 10 yards behind. They're watching him as he walks. He turns right and steps onto freshly manicured grass. As he walks along this grass, he begins to make his way through thousands of perfectly aligned white crosses that are all over this cemetery. As he walks, he begins to be overwhelmed with the emotions. And he falls in the middle of it, and he just kneels there. And as he kneels, his family comes around him. And the camera pans in as the director has it planned in the movie. If you've never seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, I just described for you the opening scene of the movie. What happens then is the director is going to take us to a flashback of a scene that happened at Normandy. This is where the opening scene was filmed at the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial in France, just outside of Omaha Beach where D-Day occurred. The movie's all about this platoon of men and their beloved Captain Miller who traips around all over France trying to find one single soldier, a needle in a stack of needles, they say, one guy named Private Ryan. The War Department had figured since he had four of his brothers who had died that it wouldn't be good for his mother to receive a fifth flag, so that's what they're there to do is to go find him and get him out of there. If you watch the movie, it's an awesome story of brotherhood. At the end of the movie, though, there's only one member of the platoon that's alive. They've all died trying to find Private Ryan. And the movie ends with the beloved Captain Miller dying on the bridge. Private Ryan walks over to him, and with his last breath, he pulls Private Ryan in, and he whispers these words in his ear. Earn it, James. Earn this. The movie then flashes back to that scene in the graveyard of the older Private Ryan, now aged, in front of the grave of Captain Miller, in which he says this. Every day I think about what you said to me on the bridge. I've tried to live the best life that I could, and I hope that it's enough. At least in your eyes, I hope that I've earned it. He stands and looks at his wife, and he says, tell me that I've been a good man. Tell me that I've lived a good life. And she says, you have. Hey, turn with me, if you have your Bibles with you, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, if you've been going through the Bible with us here at Hope Community Church this past year, in 2020, we've been walking through the Bible from Genesis all the way through. During this year, I just want to let you guys know, we have baptized 26 people so far, so far in 2020. That's many of you that are in here. And here's the thing that's so exciting and that's awesome, but there's still work to be done. You see, Jesus tells us in the Great Commission that we're to go and make disciples and baptize them, but we have to teach them to obey all things whatsoever he has commanded, right? So there's still a lot of work to do. And look, here at Hope Community Church, our mission, our mission statement is why we exist, why we began, why we're going to continue to go into the future for the glory of God. We exist to help people who are far from God find hope in God through his son, Jesus Christ, right? That's why we're here. We do that by giving hope creating community, and through being to the church. So today, that's what I want to focus on is that last part, is being the church. What does it mean to be the church? Look, every, whenever we say, let's be the church, we think of, rightfully so, hands-on, tangible ways in which we can be the church, correct? Um, we do things like adopt the block. We do things like jobs for life. We do things like one day with God where we go into prisons with the families and the children of their of, of inmates and help them. We do things like um, our um, labor of love every year. We do a lot of hands-on where we are the hands and feet of Jesus, right, in being the church. But today, here's what I want to talk about. 
is something that as we read through the epistles, which is where we are, those letters that these guys wrote to the early and new believers in the churches all over, they wrote to them, and there's a main focus that you see that you become aware of as you read. They want those new believers to live the new life that they have in Christ. We got to live it. See, we can be the church by living in this new life that Christ has for us. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 31 through 32. And if you're physically able to stand for the reading of the word, I'm going to ask that you would please stand with me. Ephesians 5, 31, 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave or be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that you would help us, empower us, God, through your spirit to leave, cleave, and become one. That as we walk through this life, ever how long that might be for any of us in here, that, Lord, this would be our formula. This would be what we are doing in our lives, that we are leaving, we are cleaving, and we are becoming one. Make your name famous in and through us in Christ's name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I believe that in Ephesians chapter 5 here, in this verse, Paul has given us a plan, a formula. I hate to even say plan, formula, and stuff like that. But he's given us this design for us to live this new life that we have in Christ by leaving, cleaving, and becoming one. You see, throughout the Bible, this verse is used for marriage, right? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, we see that that's what God is explaining what Adam and Eve are going to do. They're going to leave their father and mother and become one. We also see that Jesus references this passage when he teaches about marriage. Paul references it here when he's sort of talking about marriage, but he's really talking about the church, right? When you look at the New Testament teaching, you'll find this, and actually throughout the Bible, that God refers to his relationship with his people, and especially New Testament church, as his bride. We are the bride of Christ. We see in 2 Corinthians that the church is a bride that Jesus is perfecting so that he can present to himself this white, wonderful bride. We also see in Revelation that we as believers and the uh, uh, people of God, as the church, we are awaiting this awesome marriage supper of the Lamb that we're going to attend someday with him. But what we see is that marriage, or this leave Cleveland become one, is not only a prescription for just marriage here between a husband and wife, but it's also between us and God, us and Jesus. Now, I've been in ministry for around 20 years. I have always used leave, cleave, and become one in my premarital counseling, my crisis marriage counseling, and my enrichment counseling for marriage. Nothing else. I always use leave, cleave, and become one because there's a lot that goes along with it. But today, what I want us to focus on again is our relationship with Jesus as his bride and how leave cleave and become one can apply to us, right? Hey, the first thing that we need to do is leave. Again, we need to be, look, when we read through the epistles, you'll become keenly aware that the writers are urging new believers and us, even warning us and encouraging us that we need to leave our past life and enter into a new life that we have in Christ. It's not some future life that we're going to experience when we all get to heaven. We're going to get to experience a new life with the resurrected power of Jesus now in our lives. Let's look at a few scriptures together and see. From four different epistles, just to show you, as you read through these, you're going to see this. It's there. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone, and they're popular verses, you'll know them. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, has, he is a, say it, new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Romans 6, 4 says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Every time I baptize somebody, I always have over the years, every time they get out, I whisper in their ear, walk in this new life and hug their neck, right? Well, what do I mean by that? Just wait till you die? No. Walk in this new awesome life that God gives you now. Another uh, text here is Colossians 3, 9 through 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the, with its practices and have put on the, 
you guys are so great. You're just doing this. First service just didn't. I was like, it's on the screen for crying out loud. Read it. Anyway, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Ephesians 4, which is from the epistle we read uh, this morning. Put on the... Yay! Which is the likeness of God has been created in the righteousness and holiness of truth. Look, Jesus puts it this way about this new life. Jesus puts it this way. Luke 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Listen, leaving our old life, getting married to Jesus means that we need to leave. There's some change that's going to occur, right? When you get married, change is going to occur. The primary and most fundamental change that happens when we're married is that we're supposed to leave our life of selfishness, leave our life of it's all about me, and we enter into a marriage relationship where it's about somebody else too, right? And that's what happens when we marry into Christ and when we become his. What will help us leave, though? What is it that's going to help us leave that old way of life, leave that old self-centeredness where I'm all about me, and enter into this relationship with Jesus? What is it that would help us leave that life? What is it that's... Look, and let me tell you something. It's not easy to leave our old life behind. Amen? Am I the only one? <laughs> It's hard. It is difficult to leave that old way of life. Have you ever heard of this a psychology, uh, or psychology um, term called the Stockholm Syndrome? It's a syndrome where, look, people that have been captured or they've been um, held hostage, uh -huh, that's been hostage or have been held hostage, they get this relationship that they build between them and their captors. And they actually start to feel sorry for those captors or even love those captors. They won't testify against them. But it, 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 have you ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Raise your hand. Shawshank Redemption. I have to step back here. The lights are out my face. Okay, some of you guys need to go rent Shawshank Redemption. Today, it's an awesome movie. That and Private Ryan, it's great. But there's a scene in that movie. Shawshank Redemption is about being in prison. There's a guy named Brooks that had been in prison for like 60 years. He finally gets his pardon and he, and he moves out of the institution. Well, when he's out of the institution, he writes letters back to his buddies that are in prison and says, all I try to do is figure out ways I can get back in there with y'all. You know? And he said, he said I think I'm going to kill my boss just so I can come back in there and spend the rest of my life with you. But isn't that weird how someone who had been in prison for 60 years would not be so gloriously you know, ex I mean, excited about being free that they want to go back in? But we do that too, don't we? It's hard to live our old ways of life. It's hard to leave that old self-centeredness that that's all we're after is us. It's hard to leave those things that we have found pleasure in and those things that has, we have used and Satan has put in our path to comfort us. It's difficult to do. So how are we going to leave this old way of life? I'm going to tell you why. Here you go. We leave because of who loved us. That's it and that's all. If we could get this, we could all just leave and save yourselves like an hour. Yeah, I used to teach, leave Cleveland to come one. It was a six-hour session generally, so we're going to be here for a little while. You're going to miss the Panthers game. Just shout whenever they score or if not. But you're going to leave because of who loved you. Let me explain this. We will willfully and joyfully leave our old ways of life of death and slavery and those sinful desires when we see truly the beauty and glory and majesty of God in his son Jesus Christ in the gospel. Pastor J.D. Greer of Summit Church in Raleigh says it this way. I love this. The, the gospel is not just the diving board of which we jump into the pool of Christianity. It is the pool itself. It's not the only way we begin in Christ. It is the way we grow in Christ. Tim Keller puts it this way. The gospel is not just the ABCs of Christianity, but it is the A to Z of the Christian life that flows from the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And guys, when you read the epistles, when you begin to read these letters into, or to these early believers and to the church, you're going to find that these readers spend the first portions of of all of their letters presenting the gospel to the church. They, in Romans, when Paul writes Romans, the first five chapters, he's writing it to believers, to people who are supposed to already love Jesus. He writes them five chapters of just gospel. This is what you were. Here's what you are now. This is where you were going. Here's where you're going now. 
Here's where you were in your sin. Now you're, it's, it's just this five chapters of it. Ephesians in the book that we just read out of is four chapters of nothing but gospel. It is nothing but gospel. Here's where you used to be. Here's where you are now. Here's where you used to be seated and buried. Here's where you are seated now. You used to try to work your way into heaven. Now it's by the grace of God that you have been saved. Praise God, right? None of you can boast. And then he leads into, but look, that means our lives have to change. We see in here that these guys are reminding them, and that's what I want to do with this, is remind you, if you want to see real lasting change in our lives, we have to see it through the gospel. The gospel has to become bigger and richer and fuller in our hearts, and it'll change us. First John puts it this way. The writer John, who's the one whom Jesus loved, wrote this. He says, we love him, say it, because he first loved us. You get that we get this in our hearts. He first loved me. 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 The chief among you of sinners. I promise you in this room. He loved me. And get that in our hearts, it will change us. The gospel, guys, is the only thing that has the power to change our thoughts, to change our desires, and to change our actions. It's the gospel. If it gets in us, if Jesus Christ gets in our hearts. Remember the Bible talks about there's a new heart we'll get? <laughs> Christ's heart in us changes our actions. J.D. Greer again says this, the gospel has the greater power to produce virtue and love in our hearts than the threats that the law could ever do. The threats of the law can coerce behavior, but it cannot captivate the heart and affections. You know why? This is the way, this is the way God has it planned. God loves us into repentance. God loves us into change. God loves us in it. If you don't believe me, here we read Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Do you know that God's kindness, his goodness, is meant to lead you to what? Repentance. Hey, you guys struggling with any sins? You want to change? Do you? Please tell me that I'm not the only one in this room that struggles with sin. All of us do. The world would do well to see us struggling with sin, wouldn't it? Nearly. Paul writes in Romans in the, the church, he's talking about the grace of God, and they say, so what shall we do? Keep on sinning so that grace may abound. And Paul says, by no means do that. You can glorify God another way. But what we see here is that God's kindness and his grace should be the foundation for our living a life. I'll give you an example from Scripture. It's the best one in my, in my opinion. Jesus encounters a lady caught in adultery, right? You're familiar with this story? There's a bunch of guys from the church, and they go out and they get this woman, they set her up, catch her in adultery, bring her out in the streets naked, put her in front of Jesus and say, what should we do with her? And they all got stones in their hands, they're going to stone her. And Jesus says, whoever in here's got without sin, cast the first stone. So, doop, 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 and they all walk off, right? It's just Jesus left with her, and he looks at her and he says this, neither do I condemn you. Now, hold on, he's not done. Neither do I condemn you. Now, go and sin no more. You know what we do? We reverse this, don't we? Every religion, by the way, every religion on the planet reverses it. Every religion on the planet, and we do this a lot in our lives and in our relationship with Christ. We say, go and sin no more. Then I will not condemn you. You ever said this before? I'm going to go to church and get my life right before I? No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus says to do. What we do is we come to him and the grace that we experienced in his look, his look into our eyes and says, neither do I condemn you. Now use this as a basis, a foundation of grace to go live a life that's worthy and glorifies it, right? That is what's going to cause us to change. And look, guys, I could stand up here this morning and I could tell you that if you do not turn from your sins, you will burn in hell for eternity because that is the truth. It's the truth. If you do not have someone, if Jesus Christ does not come in and save you from your sin, that will be your fate for eternity. But that kind of threatening may produce a season of some fear-based obedience in your life, but it will never, never bring lasting change like the gospel does to a heart of the kindness of God that will lead us to continual, continual, continual repentance. 
No lasting change and certainly not a change that will glorify God. You know what it'll do? It'll be a change that will glorify self. I could do this on my own. No, we can't. No, we can't. Hey, let me give you an example of this for a moment. What if I walked in today to my house um, and walked in and my wife's in there. She's, well, this is what's going to happen. She's going to be in there uh, uh, probably cooking lunch. And I'm going to go, mm, come here. And I give her a kiss on the cheek. And she says, well, that was not, why'd you do that? Well, it told me in chapter 22. Or if I, if I actually got up off the couch from watching my Dodger games for the last month and helped her with the kids, put them in the, in the bed or, or get them in the bathtub, if I would actually do that, get up and, you know, and, and she said, well, why did you do that? That was off night. I was like, I'm tired of you nagging. You know, I've been tired of you telling me you've been threatening me for months that you weren't going to cook supper if I don't get up off the couch, right? You know, would that mean anything to her? But it would mean something different to her if I did it just because I'll see her and I love her. And I know that this is what she needs or what she wants. When we were dating, when we were dating, um, I, I lived in Lincoln. It was about 30 minutes away, and I would drive up to Kaiser to date her. And, but, and guys, when I, my wife's a knockout. I think, oh, my goodness. When I first saw her, there was no way she is going to. I, I asked her if I could kiss her because I was like, there's no, if I, if I move in with here, I'm going to get fat, you know. She is too good looking. But for whatever reason, I thought she was doing a kindness to, you know, little people like me or whatever. But anyways, um, after about three weeks of dating, after about three weeks of dating, I'm driving up to see her. And on the side of the road, there was this field of wildflowers. And I just pull over and I get out, hot as it could be, but I'm, and I'm, grab all these wildflowers and pick them up and put them in, this, you know, in my hand and I go to her house and I open the door and I give them to her and she goes, oh my gosh, oh my goodness. Good move, dude. But we, look, we go out to eat that night and she tells me this. She said, I always said that I would marry somebody. We've been dating for like three weeks. She said, well, I would always marry somebody who brought me flowers, picked me flowers. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading me to the side of the road. You know? But, but here's the thing. What made that so special for her is that I did that out of my heart, right? I did that out of my love for her. See, I can buy her flowers today and send them on anniversary, and she's like, save the money. Save the money. I don't want you buying me flowers. If I pick them, it's different. Let me ask you something before I move on. When's the last time you stopped on the side of the road and you picked Jesus some flowers just because? When's the last time you just read your Bible? Oh, this got me this week. This got me this week. So when's the last time I picked it up just because I wanted to learn how much that dude loved me, what he went through for me? Let me ask you this. When's the last time you've received a bouquet of flowers from Jesus? I would venture to say it's every day. Maybe we, just, maybe we just don't look for it. See, I could sit up here and tell you a bunch of things that would threaten you into some decision that you would pray a prayer or something like that, but it will do nothing for your salvation. And it will do nothing for the relationship that you will have continually with Christ. See, what I need to do is tell you today of this great love that God had for us through his son, Jesus Christ. This great love that he died for you. This great love that this marriage that we see that Paul says this is a mystery, it's what I'm talking about is Christ and his church, that Jesus living in heaven decided to leave his father and come down and cleave to us through a cross so that we might go and become one with him for eternity in heaven. That's awesome to think about. I pray that it grips us and changes us. And I hope it makes us do this, guys. I hope this makes us think to ourselves. And we ask the question, have I changed? Have I changed? Am I new? Is the old gone? Is there any changes going on in my heart? I hope that we look at our lives and say, is the gospel producing fruit in me? Why? Why should we ask this? It's because if the gospel has not changed us, the gospel is not in us. The Bible clearly teaches that if the gospel has not changed us, we are still dead in our sins and trespasses bound for hell. 
The gospel has to change us. Now, look, please don't get me wrong here. I am not saying at all right now that the gospel, that the gospel say, I mean, that, that our works save us. That's not good news for anybody in here, by the way. None of us. That our works and what we do and the changes that we make could save us, that is not good news for any of us, is it? What I am saying is that our outward actions show how the gospel has impacted us inwardly. This new heart that we have from Christ, this heart transplant that we've took on, yo, it'll produce change in us. It'll produce change. Hey, John says it this way in 1 John. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a, and the truth not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfecting them. If you say that we, if, guys, if we say that we love Jesus and yet we practice sin, now hold on, let me go, let me, so what I don't mean here is that we struggle with sin. Every one of us struggle with sin. I a little bit. I struggle with sin every single day, sometimes hourly, sometimes minute by minute, that we struggle with sin. We are going to struggle with sin. Paul, let me, let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul, who, who just in, in chapter 7 of Romans writes this entire chapter of how much he is struggling with sin in his life. Here's what he writes, Romans 7, 24. Wretched man that I am. Hey, anybody, anybody? Pause. Anybody in here been that way in their prayers? They just see himself. What am I going to do with myself? What am I going to do? What a wretched man. And then Paul's reminded of something. He said, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He reminds himself of the gospel. But here's the deal. The Bible clearly teaches that people who continually, habitually practice and engage in sin willfully and defiantly are lying to themselves. The gospel's not in them. So here's what we should do. Two things here. One, we should hope, I should hope that this causes us to examine our lives. Second Corinthians says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It's a good practice, isn't it? Test yourselves. Examine your life to see if you're in the faith. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? We need to look to see if we're forgiving we need to look to see if we're kind. We need to look to see if we're sorrow, or if we feel sorrow for our sin. The second thing I hope that this makes us do is that we learn to judge others. Yes, that's what I said. That's exactly what I said. Jesus doesn't tell us to never judge. Take a look at this picture of these apples. Which apple is a bad apple? How'd you know? You shouldn't have judged that apple. You know, judging it. There's no flip a coin. Is it good or bad? It's obvious, right? That the outside of this shows that there's something you don't want to bite. And that apple, it's bad news. Correct? So here's what Jesus teaches about this. How we should examine ourselves in that first scripture. And then now how we should help each other. He says, judge not that ye, you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, examine yourself, and you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What we Here's the reason why we don't do this and we don't help each other, and we don't help each other examine ourselves and look at our lives for the sake of salvation and for the sake of our great relationship with Jesus is we've got this wrong in the church. How many of you guys have ever been approached with someone with a holier-than-thou attitude? Can I say that holier-than-thou? You know what I'm talking about? That holier, that I'm, I'm holier than you. And we approach this with this attitude and this tone that why can't you be more like me? Why can't you be more like us Christian people and we're all, right? Or we approach this with this gotcha mentality. I caught you. I caught you in it. All of this, guys, this type of attitude that is clearly judgmental condemnation of another, a dismissal of them because of love, which is not what Christ said do. All of this is rooted in a lack of love. You see, we're supposed to speak the truth to one another, aren't we? But we're supposed to do it in love. 
Galatians 6 says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. The language here, caught, is like a wild animal caught in a snare. How many of you guys, please, how many have ever seen a brother or sister or someone you love just caught in it? They're caught in sin. It just, it's got them. Whatever it is, you name it, whether it's gossip or whether it's lying or whether it's sports or whether it's pursuit of, of, of job or life or career or it's drugs or alcohol, they're just snared in it. We need to go to them and not say, hey, I'm not judging you, bro, or anything like that. hope everything's good. We go to them and say, look, I see that you're caught in this sin. How might I help? What we need in this world, guys, and especially from us as believers, is we need more coaches in this world than we do referees. Here's what I mean by that. We need less people that blow the whistle at sin, right? That's what that is, right? And just help with it. We need people to see that we are fighting for them, not fighting them. Someone that would say, hey, bro, I've noticed this in your life lately, man, and I just want to let you know how much Christ loves you. And have you considered, man, that this might be a, something wrong with your relationship with Jesus? Maybe you need to go to him so you guys can spend some time together so that Jesus can cleave. Last two points. Now, once we leave that way of life, we're to cleave to Jesus. Here's how we do this. Here's how we cleave. We cleave because he holds us together. I am a Los Angeles Dodger fan. I've been a Los Angeles Dodger fan before birth. Yeah, um, when I came out, my dad had like a hat and put it on me, whatever. But I've been a Dodger fan, and for the last eight years, we've been a really good team. But for the past six, we have been a phenomenal team, the best team in the league. I'll say it that way. Since 2016, we acquired a guy named Justin Turner. And Justin Turner turned the team around to make us a great team. Last five years, we won four um, division titles, we won three National League championships. We're in the World Series for the third time. Please pray we win. I was up till 1230 last night. I don't know where I'm getting the energy to preach this sermon right now, but we lost with one strike to go. My son can't handle it. If we lose, my son cannot handle it. We will have to pay for counseling and all sorts of stuff. Pray that we win this series. But we became a great team, and the manager, Dave Roberts, he's been interviewed several times in the last five years, and he always says, Justin Turner is the glue that sticks this team together. Justin Turner is the glue that keeps the clubhouse together. Justin Turner is the glue that causes us to win. Guys, we all need a Justin Turner in our life. We need someone to hold us together. And Jesus is what holds us together. He cleaves to us. Colossians 1, 17 says this, And he is before, Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see, Jesus is the gospel. You want to get, hey, guys, I don't know about you, but I have many days where my life seems like it is falling completely apart. Amen? I have many times where I think my family and I start to lose, and I start to think of all things that might happen, and I start to worry, and everything starts to seem like it's coming unraveled. And what I need is just to fall on my knees and go to Jesus, right? Because he's the glue that's going to hold me together. Jesus, what happens when we talk about cleaving here is Jesus moves in to live with you. Did you know that? Christ moves in. This is marriage. You're going to leave and cleave. He's going to move in with you, and he's going to come and live with you. Read this here, John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we, we will come to him and make our home with him. Did you hear that? Does that not sound awesome? This is a promise from God, that God will come to live with us in our home. That means we got some closet cleaning to do, right? I'm stuffing stuff in, right? <laughs> Trying to keep it away. And he opens the door and says, what about this? We try to, look, this is what it means to live with it. Galatians 2 says this, I am crucified with Christ. You've heard this before. That's the lead part. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives where? In me. Look, cleaving is when we live with Jesus. And when you live with someone, you share life with them. You pay bills together. You want a recipe for disaster in your marriages? Have separate accounts. I've been doing counseling for 20 years on crisis counseling. It is a disaster. You share the load. You share with one another. You share life together. You do things together. You talk with each other. You argue with one another. You do activities together. You face tragedies and triumphs together. And that's when Christ cleaves. 
I asked my staff this week and some other guys I know have been married for a long time, I said, hey, tell me something. Tell me what's God used in your life to get you and your wife to cleave, to come and become one together. What's he used in your life? And every single one of them, bar none, told me struggles, struggles. Can you, uh, me, my wife and I, when we first got married, I had a job making $14 an hour. She didn't have a job. She had just lost her job. I'm working, trying to pay bills, trying to do everything. Ramen and Tostitos pizzas every Friday and Saturday night. Our going out was going to Dollar General. That's going out. But we loved it. I would, I tell her all the time, I would go back there in a skinny minute, wouldn't you? And she goes, no. Maybe I'm a little more nostalgic about it, but we, those times of struggle, I can remember sharing those times where, you know, hey, how are we going to do that? Well, I've got to go get a job building the deck so that we can pay for that bill. And that's just struggling and praying together. I remember when I walked in one time, the phone rings, I'm sitting there eating my Tostitos pizza, and my wife goes, yes, okay, I'll tell him. Sit down, Jeremy. I said, what is it? It's mama, isn't it? And she said, yeah, it's your mama. She's got cancer. Tess came back today. And I grabbed a hold of her hands. And in that little bitty old kitchen up there in that little yellow house, and we began to pray, and then we began to sing How Great Thou Art together. Oh, precious times that we share. I remember when we, we were, um, I've been married for five years, and we were getting ready to have our first child. I mean, like hours before then. We're at the hospital, and they tell us, y'all need to go walk around. So we're walking around the hospital just holding hands through these little, I don't even know that they had these hallways there at the hospital in Shelby, but we're walking around holding hands, and it was as if God was giving me and her, so our, us, the last minutes of when I called her Ashley instead of Mama from there on out. We'll never forget them. We talk about them all the time, me and her, but let me ask you something. What about you and Jesus? Have you shared in the struggles? I was just talking with a family this week that they had lost one, their, their mother, their dear mother. And one of them looked over at me and said, you know what, this is bringing us so much closer to Jesus. You ever had tragedies like that in your life where you can just feel him near? Where he's just there. That's what cleaving is and that's what he wants us to do is cleave to him. Guys, this word cleave is a mason's return. It's a masonry term. It's the masonry term used in Greek to describe mortar and the agent that's in mortar to cleave it to the brick. Now, look, I built houses for years and did construction. I'm going to tell you, if I were to take a hammer and try to bust this mortar off of this brick, you know what's going to happen? What's going to happen is, is that it's going to take pieces of this brick with it. You know why? Because they've been joined, cleaved together for so long that they're actually one now. So when you bust one off, take pieces of the other. That's what I always tell people in crisis counseling when they come to me, I'm ready to get a divorce. And I said, do you know how that's going to harm you? I know you're after harming the other right now, but you know how much it's going to harm you because the two are one, right? But Jesus cleaved us so closely that we become one with him, that we're inseparable. And when that happens, guys, we become so meshed to him, we become one. This is the final point. Leaving, cleaving, and becoming one. St. Augustine, the early church writer, was known to be a womanizer before he came to Christ. He was known to frequent prostitutes and to have all sorts of um, um, liaisons with women. And after he had come to Jesus, he's walking through this district and one of the ladies who he used to have an affair with and used to have relations with, he, she's yelling at him and she's trying to get his attention, Augustine, Augustine, it's me, it's me. And Augustine just keeps walking and she shouts out again and she says her name, it's me. And Augustine pauses and turns around and says, yes, I know it's you, I recognize you, but it's no longer I. He had walked with him for so long he had left that life, cleaving to Christ as Christ would cleave and draw near to him in his life, that it was no longer him that was living, as Paul said, but it was Christ living in and with him. That's a changed life that I pray for all of us as we go to be the church. You see, what happens is when we become one, we share the same purpose. Hear this. When we become one with Christ, we share the same purpose that Christ did. 
Jesus said in John 17 this, I have glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. That's what he said with the Father. That was his purpose. Well, what's our purpose? Ephesians chapter 3, 21 says this. Repeatedly in Ephesians, it says this. I just picked this verse. To, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. Our purpose is to glorify God with our lives. We are to live lives that are so different, that are so forsaking of the world, forsaking of our own desires, that people would actually ask, what's happened to you? <laughs> what's changed you when you could say, no, it's who? First Peter says it this way, but in your hearts honor Christ. That's the life. The Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Did you hear that? They're to look at your life and go, what is it that's so different about you? Where do you have your hope? Where do you have all of this that's happened to you? And it says that we do it with gentleness and respect, as we've talked about. I believe that, and I hope that we'll leave here and that every day we'll wake up and we'll look at the cross. And we'll just come before Jesus and we'll say, I've tried to live a good life. And I know I can't. Can you help me today? I want to glorify you today. I need you. And unlike the movie Private Ryan, we have to change something. Jesus Christ would never pull us close and say, earn this. Jesus Christ would pull us close and say, glorify this. Bring glory to it. As we leave our old life because of how awesome the gospel is, as we cleave by sharing our lives and stories with him and becoming one in the purpose of the glory of God. If everybody will bow their head and close their eyes, I want to pray for us. If you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus and entering into a relationship with him and being married to him, I pray and promise you that he is calling you now. He wants you to leave that life of death and of sin and slavery and enter into a life of freedom with him. If you're here and at some point in your life, you've examined your life, and maybe even today you've examined it and you see that there's no change. And the prayer that you prayed when you were a child was only something to make your parents happy or to get you out of hell free or get you into heaven. But there's no change that today you'll pray and say, Lord Jesus, this has caused me to examine my life and made me think, do I have you? And better yet, do you have me? If you're here and you have this relationship, but it's been hindered by sin, there's power over it. In the name of Christ, we pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. Make your name famous in and through us. In Christ's name, amen.